Hey everyone, welcome to Logan's Mosh Pit. Glad to have you here. Do me a favor and please subscribe if you haven't already. Let's dive in to a new episode of Rock and Read. Out of the way, Bieber Fever. Today we'll read Chapter 4 of White Line Fever by Lemmy. Chapter 4 is called Batman. I am vengeance. I am the night. I am Batman. Here we go. I left the rocking of the cars thinking I was going to be a star in my own right immediately. Everything was going to be wonderful and huge women would get a hold of me and do things to me with raw carrots. You know, like that. Of course, it didn't happen quite that way. The first time I went to London, I lasted there for about a month after waking up on Ron Wood's mum's sofa. I stayed with a friend of mine called Murphy, whom I knew from when he was living in Blackpool. He was a little Irish folk singer, fellow Dosser. Nice character. We used to know these two tailors who would make all our clothes. They'd measure the inside of your leg four or five times. They liked Murph, and Murph would go hang out with them now and again. He wasn't them, though. At least, I don't think so. But they made him a Batman suit with a hood and bat wings that went from the arms to the waist. He was going to fly off Blackpool Tower, see, publicity stunt-like. Blackpool Tower is a scale model of the Eiffel Tower. It's about a quarter the size. Still too tall to fly off if you don't make it, really. But Murph got all dressed up in his bat suit, and we all went with him, headed straight for the geezer at the ticket stand. Hello! Murph announced. I am Murph the Batman. Let me in. Why? The ticket seller geezer inquired. I'm going to fly off the top, Murph declared. No, you're not. I am, Murph insisted. No, you're not. Out of my way, demanded the five foot five bat person. I'll tell you what, mate, the guy told him. You give me the money and then fly up there. And if you make it, you can come back down and I'll give you your money back. How's that? He took the glory away from poor Murph, his fleeting chance of a claim to fame. Anyhow, Murph had already gone to London when I decided to head down there myself. He had this terrible rat hole flat in Sunbury on Thames. Well, it wasn't that bad a flat, except there were about 20 of us Dossers living in its four or five rooms, and there was no hot water, no grub, and no money either. We were getting a band together, me and Murph and Roger, this drummer. He had no drums, but he played on cushions. I ran out of patience after a short while, so I went up north. I woke up one morning sitting on a beach in South Shields eating cold baked beans out of a can with my comb. I thought, there's got to be more to life than this. So I went back home and got fed for a bit. I didn't see Murph again for about 30 years, and when I did, I was pleasantly surprised to find that he had weathered the years with his mind relatively intact. At least, what was left of it after the 60s. He's now an author. When I saw him, he gave me a novel he'd written. When I get around to reading it, I'll let you know how it is. Not long after I'd returned home, the birds were playing up in Northwich near Manchester, so I got a ride down with them back to London. When I got there, I phoned the only number I knew in London, apart from John Lord, Neville Chesters. He had been a roadie for the Who and the Mercy Beats. I asked if I could doss out on his floor, and he told me to come on over. At that time, Neville was working for the Jimi Hendrix Experience, and he was sharing the flat with Noel Redding, Hendrix's bass player. They needed a spare set of hands, so about three weeks after I landed at Neville's, I got a job working for them. Jimi Hendrix was huge in England at the time. He had just had two number one records, but no one in America had heard of him yet. I worked for his band for about a year on all the TV shows and the tours through England. I didn't get to go on any of the foreign gigs, unfortunately, because I was only a fetcher and a lifter. Still, it was an amazing experience. Hendrix was the most startling guitarist ever. No doubt about that. Everything about him was great. His playing was truly astounding. Plus, he had a great stage act. He was like a cat, a snake. When he performed, he would drive the chicks nuts. I had seen him go in his bedroom with five chicks, and they'd all come out smiling, too. And, of course, the road crew got the spin-offs. A stud, Hendrix was, and I'm crass enough to think that that's quite a good thing. I don't know what's wrong with being a stud. It's more fun than not being a stud, that's for sure. Unfortunately, I didn't get to mix with him off stage much. 
I wasn't part of his private life. I was just working for him. I do recall that he was a very gentle, very nice guy. But most people were nicer in those days. It was one of those ages of innocence, you know? Nobody had started dying. Yet. I like the other two guys in the experience, too. Noel Redding was alright, only he used to wear a night shirt to bed and Aladdin-type shoes with the curly toes and a nightcap with a tassel. That was quite a sight. Mitch was nuts, as he still is today, in fact. One time I was standing on a traffic island in the middle of Oxford Street, and Mitch bounced up to me, wearing a white fur coat, white trousers, white shirt, shoes, and socks. Complete vision, you know. Hello, I don't know who I am, he said, and ran off again. I don't think he knew who I was either. This period of time, the late 60s, was brilliant for rock and roll in Britain. There were, hadn't been such a wealth of talent in one era since. The Beatles, the Stones, the Hollies, the Who, Small Faces, Downliner Sect, Yardbirds had all come out of the same three-year period. The British invasion had changed the face of rock music for all time. So in London, we were sitting on top of the world. There was a lot of blues going on. Savoy Brown, which was much bigger in the States than in England, and Fog Hat started off as blues bands, and the jazz blues thing came in for a little while. There were people like Graham Bond, who had Jack Bruce in his band, and Ginger Baker, both of whom went on to be in Cream. The Beatles had just come out with Sgt. Pepper, so they were certainly flavor of the month. Two of them had just gotten busted, too, so they could do no wrong. John Lennon as Icon, Martyr, and Yoko looking violated at his side. Everywhere you looked, there were good bands coming up. It's depressing nowadays because you have to dig to find a really great band, and there seem to be thousands of awful ones. There were thousands of bands then too, but really, at least half of them were great. Just to give you an example, I was along for Hendrix's second UK tour, which ran from November 14, 1967 until December 5th. Co-headlining were The Move, who had also just had two number ones in a row, then Pink Floyd with Sid Barrett, his last tour. Amen Corner, who were then at number two, The Nice featuring a young organ player called Keith Emerson, and The Heir Apparent, later to become the Grease Band backing Joe Cocker. All for an entrance fee of seven shillings and six pence, 70 cents American, and that was normal for the era. You didn't think I'd get to talking about 60s London without mentioning drugs, do you? Oh no, not I. Our whole crew was on acid during the entire tour, and we all got the job done just fine. Orgasms on acid, by the way, are excellent. Really unbelievable. So I was doing plenty of that, too. As a matter of fact, acid was still legal back then. There weren't any laws against it until the end of 67. And as for marijuana, well, you could have passed by the average copper on the street, smoking a joint, and he wouldn't have known what it was. In fact, a friend of mine once told a cop it was a herbal cigarette, and the guy went for it. It just seemed like all of London was out of their heads back then. We used to get high and go down to the park and talk to the trees. Sometimes the trees would win the argument. We were told that acid didn't work on two consecutive days, but we found out if you double the dose, it does. There were some great clubs in London like the Electric Garden and Middle Earth. You'd go there and everybody would be tripping. There was a chick who used to stand in the doorway of Middle Earth by the cash register handing out acid. She'd give one to each person as he or she walked in free. One thing we used to do was get a crystal of acid which had a hundred trips in it and dissolve it into a hundred drops of distilled water in a bottle. Then we'd take a dropper and lay the mixture out in rows on a sheet of newspaper. Then when it was dry we'd put the page back in the paper, go out, rip off the corners and sell them to people for a quid. Sometimes, if you were lucky, you'd get a piece of the treated newspaper that had two trips on it. Other times, a soggy bit of paper. Real acid tripping. In those days, wasn't all groovy, like peaceful. The first trip I took lasted for 18 hours, and I couldn't really see. All I saw were visions, not what was actually around me. Everything, every sound, you could snap your fingers and it would be like a kaleidoscope. Doof! Your eyes would just turn into noise-activated colored strobes, and all the time your mind felt like you were on a roller coaster. Sometimes slow at the approach to the top of each drop, and then, whee! Your teeth would kind of sizzle, and if you started laughing, it was incredibly hard to stop. You could say I liked acid, but acid is a dangerous drug, as if you're complacent, because it'll wake your butt up. If you were a little uneasy about yourself, you would either be catalyzed by it, or you wouldn't show up again. 
You know, they take your tie and shoelaces away and your belts and put you in a room with no windows in it and a lot of soft walls. Uh, lots of people I knew went to the Basket Weavers Hotel on acid. Everybody was taking pills, too. Uppers like Blues, Black Beauties, and Dextrin. It was all pills. I never took powder for years and years. Really, if you're in a band, or especially if you're a roadie, you need to take them things because otherwise you can't keep up with the pace. You can't go on a three-month tour without being on something. I don't give a what they say. Keep fed, eat your greens, drink juice. Off. It's not true. I don't care if you eat 200 artichokes. You still won't last through a three-month tour doing a gig a day. Everybody did downers as well. We were doing mandrax, the same as quaaludes in the States. Once we bought a canister of a thousand mandrix, but when we opened it, they'd all melted. They must have got wet somehow. There was just this mushy mess of mandrix at the bottom of this thing. So we laid it all out on the breadboard, rolled it down with a rolling pin and put it under the grill, and we wound up with this white sheet of mandrix and we'd snap off a corner and eat it. Sometimes she just got a mouthful of chalk, the binding, and sometimes she'd get three mandrix, sort of opium rushed roulette. I had a prescription for dextrin and mandrix. In those days, there were a lot of doctors who'd prescribe you anything if you gave them the money. Harley Street doctors at that, and the doctor I went to took me off Mandrix because the law had just been passed against it and put me on Tunol as a substitute. They were horrifying, really. Back to the rock and roll part of my story as opposed to the drugs or the sex parts. Eventually, I did start playing in some bands around London. At first, I got a job playing guitar for P.P. P. Arnold. She used to become one of the Icats, and she had a couple of hits in England. I was in her band for about two weeks until she had discovered I couldn't play lead, so I lost that job. Then in 68, I wound up singing for Sam Gopal. He was half Burmese, half Nepalese, or something like that. I forget now. But he played tablas, which are impossible to amplify. They're too boomy. See, at least they were for the equipment at the time. He had had a band previously called the Sam Gopal Dream, which had been on a show called Christmas on Earth with Hendrix in December of 67. Some people think I played that gig, but I didn't. By the time I met up with Sam, he had dropped the dream and was just going on as Sam Gopal, in suitably modest fashion. I was introduced to Sam by a friend of mine called Roger de Ella. He played guitar, and his grandmother was Mary Claire, a very famous English actress. A long time ago, I was living in Roger's house, and he told me he was forming a band with Sam Gopal and this bassist Phil Duke, and they needed a geezer who could sing. The music was sort of a blend of psychedelia, blues, and Middle Eastern rhythms meets the damned. We recorded one album, did one tour through Germany, and played a gig at the Speakeasy in London. That show at the Speak was standing ovation time, so we thought we were going to be stars, but it was actually all downhill from there on in. Sam was determined to be a star. That's what he really wanted. He was a real poser, but I didn't mind that at all. I mean, I'm a poser. What are you doing in this business if you're not a poser, right? So Sam was alright. He had his own ideas and all, but he let me write anything I wanted to. I wrote nearly all the songs that wound up on our only album. Back then, I was still using my stepfather's name, so I'm listed as Ian Lemmy Willis. I credited group on a few of the songs, but the truth is I stayed up and wrote them in one night. That was when I first discovered this wonderful drug called methadrine. The only two I didn't do on the record were Angry Faces, which was written by Leo Davidson, and a Donovan song, Season of the Witch. We did a fair version of it, actually. The album Escalator was put out by this record company called Stable. That was a joke. It was run by these two Indian geezers who had no idea whatsoever how to run a record label. I don't know how that whole deal came together. It was one of the Sam's projects. He knew the producer and all. Escalator wound up doing nothing. Zero. Stable was too indie of a label, even for the indies. Eventually it dawned on us that the band was going nowhere, so we just gave it up. Funny enough, I ran into Sam Gopal in 1991, just before I left England to move to America. It was very strange, because he was just walking up the street right around where I lived, and I hadn't seen him for ten years. We chatted for a bit, and he told me he was getting a band together. You know, all that fun stuff. Still... After Sam Gopal, I spent about a year with my guitar hanging on the wall, and I just tripped out and dossed around, living in squats. It's easy to do when you're young, and I was 23. It was around the time I learned to hate heroin. It was always around, of course, but not very much at first. It started to be a real problem around 1970. 
I knew this guy, Preston Dave. He wasn't even a junkie. He was getting there, but not quite. And a bunch of us were sitting with him at a wimpy bar, the early English attempt at, say, Burger King. It was in Earl's Court Road and was open all night. Preston was shaking and <laughs> So he went off to Piccadilly, where he went to score heroin. So he came back and went to the toilet. A few minutes later, he came lurching out backwards. His face was blank and his tongue was sticking out. Somebody had sold him rat poison, took his money, smiled at him, and sold him certain death. I thought, hell, if that's the kind of people who are hanging around with heroin, you can have it. And I also saw people doing horrible fixes with old blunt needles that would really mess their arms up. You'd see people with embolisms in their arms the size of a cricket ball, and they'd be selling their butts off shot. It always looked like misery to me, no fun at all. I've had so many friends die from heroin, but the worst of it was that the girl I was most in love with in my life died of the stuff too. Her name was Sue, and she was the first girl I ever lived with. She was all 15 when we first got together. Most embarrassing if caught by the police, but there you go. I was just 21 when we met in 1967 anyway, so I wasn't exactly some randy old geezer. More like two randy young ones. The big deal, at least to everyone else, was that she was black. We were ostracized completely. All our friends left us, hers and mine. And this was supposed to be the era of peace and love, you know? Everybody was listening to black music for the first time and all. Ha! It just proved how hypocritical they all were. Nobody knew how to deal with us. My friends left because I was associating with a which I thought was very bad news all around. Holes. Her black friend thought I was the oppressor stealing a young black girl and making her my plaything and bollocks. I pointed out to them that when I left the house, I didn't hold her by the wrist. She would come with me if she wanted and stay if she wanted, but Sue and I didn't care really. Hell, if you lose friends like that, they ain't your friends anyway. Besides, we were in love, so no one else mattered anyhow. Sue and I used to fight like cat and dog, though. She was a triple Gemini, so you never knew what personality you were talking to. We never had enough money, and then she started working at the speakeasy. She kept getting offers from people. She was young and only just discovered she was beautiful, so people took her for a ride. While she was working at the speak, we split up. One of the four or five times during the course of our relationship. And then she screwed Mick Jagger. I asked her afterwards, what was he like? And she said, well, he was good, but he wasn't as good as Jagger, you know? Which was perfect. She meant, of course, that Jagger couldn't live up to his own reputation. No way he could, even if he swung in, pole vaulted into the room on his. Well, you catch my drift. Anyway, Sue eventually got a job dancing in Beirut. That was before it got demolished, and it was still a playground of the western world. She returned with a staggering heroin habit, and it was never quite the same after that. I had just gone back with her, and she went up to her granny's. While she was there, she got one of her friends to come around with some smack. So they went in the bathroom and shut the door, did the <laughs> drew herself a bath, and then she passed out and drowned it in her own bath water. She was all of 19. I was in London when she died. I had joined Hawkwind by this time. But I didn't go to the funeral. I mean, who wants to see them dead? I like them alive. She had a sister, Kay. She was as pretty as Sue. I don't know what happened to her, but if she's reading this, get in touch. We'll talk about Sue a bit, yes? So I knew from personal experience that heroin was the most awful drug to get involved with, but that doesn't mean I didn't go through a few harrowing experiences involving the search for my own substance of choice. One time, about 69 or 70, I really came unstuck. A bunch of us were sitting around waiting for the speed to arrive. This guy was going out with a nurse, C, who worked at a dispensary. So he bribed her into getting us some amphetamine sulfate. Finally, she came in with a mason jar with what looked like amphetamine sulfate written on it. And we, greedy that we were, dug in immediately. But it wasn't amphetamine. It was atropine sulfate, belladonna, poison. We'd all done about a teaspoonful of it, like 200 times the overdose, and we went berserk, the whole lot of us. I was walking around with a TV under my arm, talking to it. Somebody else was trying to feed the trees outside his window. It was all really interesting for a while, actually. Then we all passed out, and somebody called Release, this firm with a free drug rescue van, and they all loaded us in the back like bundles of wood and took us to the hospital. 
I woke up in this bed and I could see through my hand. I could see the wrinkles in the sheet under it. Then I saw the institution walls. <laughs> me, I thought. I was convinced I'd landed in the loony bin. Then I realized it was a normal hospital because the sleeves on the jacket weren't long enough. And I saw across from me my friend Jeff just waking up. Psst, Jeff. What? We're in the hospital. Wow. <laughs> we gotta get out of here. Are you okay? Yeah. Be quiet. So we got out of bed and I was just pulling up the jockeys when... Argh, they're all over the floor! And he was leaping and screaming, eyes like organ stops. Worms and grubs and ants! Roar! I got back in bed. <laughs> Eventually the doctor showed up. If we'd got to you in another hour, you would have been dead. I was thinking, I bet you're sorry, you miserable pugger. He said we'd had the antidote and that it would take us a while to wear off. Well, it took two weeks, and it was a really strange time. I mean, I would be sitting, reading a book, and I'd turn to page 42, but there was no book. Or I'd walk down the street thinking I was carrying a case, and suddenly, oops, I'd have nothing in my hand. Weird, but interesting. Not interesting enough to do it again, though. Finally, after dossing around for some months, I wound up in another band, Opal Butterfly. I met their drummer, Simon King, in a place called the Drugstore in Chelsea. The drugstore was a big flash gaff about three floors high. There was a restaurant at the top and a boozer on the ground floor and a record store in the basement. All these boutiques and other stores too. It was one of the first mall type places. It was rather expensive, but it was an alright place. The guys in Opal Butterfly used to hang out there to drink, and I hooked up with Simon and just sort of drifted into the band. I didn't really know why I was hanging out with him. I never got along with him all that well. But you will be hearing more about Simon later. Anyway, Opal Butterfly was a good band, but they never went anywhere. They had been around for years when I got in, and it was only a few months after that that they gave it up. One of the guys, Ray Major, went on to be in Mott the Hoople. The breakup turned out to be rather timely, because it was only a couple of months later that I wound up in Hawkwind. Well, that's the end of Chapter 4. Let me know what you guys thought of Chapter 4 in the comments. That does it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate the support. I'll see you next time. Till then, rock on.